The Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service has been dedicated to educating Texans for over a century. In 1915, the Extension Program was established under the federal Smith-Lever Act to deliver university knowledge and agricultural research findings directly to the people. Ever since, AgriLife Extension Programs have addressed the emerging issues of the day, serving diverse populations across the state. Texans turn to Extension for solutions in horticulture, agriculture, 4-H and youth, and family and consumer sciences. Extension agents respond not only with answers, but also with resources and services that result in significant returns on investment to boost the economy. Join us Fridays at 1 o'clock for the AgriLife Extension Hour. Today on the AgriLife Extension Hour, we will be featuring Michael Potter with Landscape and Gardening in Montgomery County. Hi, this is Michael Potter with the uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, I'm here today uh, again with uh, Mr. Bob Daly. Uh, we've kind of tag teamed and we're going to talk about a few winter chores and things to do uh, this time of year. And we're also going to talk a little bit about water conservation in our yard. And, uh, Great. Hi, Mike. Hi, Bob. How are you today? Good. Yourself? Wonderful. Enjoying the good sunlight and cool temperatures. And uh, just as the plants are finally able to start to see some sunlight because we've had some really cloudy days. We have, and it's beautiful out there right now. Yeah, it is. Um, okay, well, let's kick off with some winter chores, uh, some things that uh, might help you save water, save plants, and, and keep your pocketbook a little fuller than what it normally is this time of year. Sounds great. Uh, you know, I just I just got some wildflower seeds from, uh, from Wild Seed Farms up in Fredericksburg, and uh, I'm wondering... You know, is it too late to plant them? No, it's not, actually. Um, there are some seeds that do come up uh, this time of year and start to sprout this time of year. You're supposed to put some of them out, like blue bonnets and stuff, a little earlier. Um, but you can still put them out, and uh, you can still put them out this time of year, and they'll still sprout. Uh, and especially a lot of them will sprout in the spring anyway, so now is a good time to go ahead and plant them. Uh, just make sure you, you know, rough up the ground a little bit before you spread the seeds. And, and after you spread those seeds out, you kind of, uh, you know, use a rake or something like that to just kind of put some soil over the top of them before they get watered in by the natural rains. Uh, you know, the, uh, we planted some last year and they were just gorgeous, but uh, I was afraid that I think I planted some of them way too early and uh, they started coming up when it got warm, like today. Yeah. And uh, they, al- so. they also can become good uh, bird seed. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> that does happen. Uh, you, I've seen many people go out and put a whole bunch of seeds out, and the next thing you know, the birds come through and, uh, and pluck everything out of the ground. That's so, right. Yeah, I've seen that too. <laughs> yeah. What, what about uh, uh, vegetables right now? Uh, vegetables right now, most of your uh, cool season vegetables are coming in. Uh, the only thing you can really kind of late plant at this point in time would be maybe some lettuce to kind of get a late cropping. Uh, but most of your cool seasons should be already producing, and, mm-hmm. and they'll be coming down to the, the short rows, as we like to say, kind of in the agriculture world. Um, when we start getting some good frost and stuff, they might need to go ahead and just pull them out and, and start thinking about preparing the seed beds for uh, for your spring garden for spring gardens I, I know i have my broccoli's producing right now mm-hmm. and i've got a couple of heads of cabbage and that are already ready to pick and stuff like that so it looks pretty good yeah. uh y'all have a we have a planting chart that's really fantastic uh i don't know if you have a yes that one uh yeah, we wanna... we've got a wonderful planting chart that the for many years our, our master gardeners and the extension agents even before me had taken taken the time and really put out a year planting chart uh, by month and and by different types of vegetables and everything. Um, that's something that you can uh, you can actually go to the our, our the master gardener website and download at uh, www.mcmga.com. Um, that's our website and, and you just look for vegetable planting chart. And if you, and if of course, if you don't want to go straight to the website, if you just Google uh, Montgomery County, Texas vegetable planting chart, uh, it'll pop up. But it's a, it's a great guide, and it tells you, you know, kind of when the marginal planting times in are for a lot of the vegetables, uh, and that way you can have a good productive garden. Uh, you know, you said spoke about getting getting ready for spring. What do, what do we uh, what do we need to do after? Uh the lettuce is finished. Yeah, once everything's finished and you go ahead and pull everything out, um, some people like to plant, you know, some cover crops like, you know, rye or something like that. And, and that way when it clover. gets... Clover. Yeah, clover and things like that that add organic matter or nitrogen back into the soil. 
um, and those and those crops are typically grown all the way through you know probably about February uh, uh-huh. and then tilled under and used as a as a green manure in a sense sure and then it comes decompose it decomposes in the soil and then uh, is used as a nutrient you know it's really funny last year I we uh, st- I started some tomatoes on my uh, seeds mm-hmm. and last part of February I guess the last week in February the last few days in February I decided I said oh it's very warm I'm going to plant my tomatoes and of course I lost every single one of them because <laughs> the frost came the next day it really was a lesson for the you know what farmers really face right. you know on a regular annual basis on this kind of thing yeah and in fact uh, and that, that's good that you say that I mean you can go back to the vegetable planting chart that we've got Mother Nature, of course, always throws a monkey wrench in what we do. Sure. Um, you know, we can say, oh, this year is going to be a typical year, and, and that, that may not necessarily be the case. But, you know, even our planning chart kind of takes those things into consideration. And, and for instance, you know, for tomatoes, we're saying March is the best time to plant them. Uh, and, you know, if you're planting a whole bunch of plants, remember to stagger your plantings. Uh, if you're going to, you know, start from seed, make sure you start them say, about six weeks out before right. transplant dates. And um, let them grow up. So, like the middle of January for tomatoes, let's say mm-hmm. something like that. Yes, sir. And and that way they they kind of sprout. And, and I always try to do you know five or ten plants, and then about a week, week and a half later, I do about five or ten more. Uh-huh. And that staggering in in size can actually do a couple of things for you uh, with all your vegetables. Number one, it prolongs your harvest. Uh, number two, it also, if you have disease or insect issues that may come, come about, yeah. typically those happen at certain stages of development of the plant. Uh, right. So you can actually have a group of plants that get hit by insects and one that actually misses it. That's that's uh, that's good advice, yeah. Uh, I know that for, for several kinds of vegetables, like broccoli and stuff like that, uh, in the winter vegetables, I do that as well. Uh, there's a planting, not a planting chart, but there's also a variety chart that I think you may have prepared. Uh, it's on one of the websites. I can't remember where it is, but it's uh, – you might want to say something about Yeah, um, there's there several ways to get to it. Um, one of them is through the Aggie Horticulture website. Um, there's an area to go in there and select the county you're in, and it actually pulls up all the vegetable varieties for that county. Um, so if you live in Walker or Waller or anywhere else in the state of Texas, you can pull up a list that's uh, – that's catered to your area and of course another good source is our master gardeners up at the office Uh, they of course a lot of them grow different stuff and and have some some different crops that they they try out right i know so one of the guys grew some creole tomatoes when you're in they were very good you know it's just they're not as hardy and you know you know we've got some uh some lettuces up there right now that we're kind of experimenting with uh, and we're trying to see which ones bolt the fastest and that that you know, shooting up a flower sure. may, means they're done, and then that, that's so we're trying to see you know which of the ones that work and which one doesn't. Well, the one that first bolted was the one that was the prettiest one, and it was called Freckles, <laughs> Freckles. and it was green with red splotches in it. It was really pretty, really pretty. But, yeah. yeah, but it was the first one to go. So, God, uh, and uh, let's. I want to talk about the. You've got some experimental gardens out there, the vegetable gardens. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that that's really fascinating out there. Yeah, mean? we we really try to do you know in, in the vegetable lists, you know the the varieties that grow here. Well, a lot of times you'll find things where people you know put out there, hey, this is the best vegetable there is, or best lawn seed grass there right. is. Right? Yeah, you got some. Yeah, yeah. we're we'll talking about and it, that. And it's not uh, it's not for this area. Um, so we kind of try to narrow that down and get varieties that are just specifically for here and do well in our envir- environment. Well, Mike, uh, you talked about grass. Uh, aren't you putting in a uh, uh, some kind of grass test, uh, lawn test uh, site over there? Yes, uh, we're slowly working on it. Uh, it's it, We've had, originally in our orchard area, uh, we had a lot of fruit trees and everything in there. Well, the days of, of big orchards, uh, those guys know what they're doing. Sure. Uh, and our main job is to teach homeowners you know, kind of backyard gardening skills. So we're going to kind of integrate a little bit of demonstration regarding turf grass, uh-huh. uh, different varieties of turf grass, and show drought tolerance, uh, disease you know resistance and insect resistance, um, growth patterns, and you know even texture and other things that are that are different between different grasses. But we're also going to implement kind of like a backyard orchard in a sense. Um, they're planted in the ground like the typical homeowner would, right? Uh, and kind of we, we've done some different things uh, even with our um, uh, last year, two years ago. Uh, we started not trimming our uh, dwarf peaches. 
on some okay. of them. And, uh-huh. and we had some varieties that we either trimmed or not trimmed. And it was kind of interesting to find out that they, they, they do perform a little differently. Well, the grasses, are, uh, are you checking like uh, zoysia and... Yeah, and, uh, we're, we're looking at St. Augustine, and we're going to look at several different types of St. Augustine. Uh, not just your common... Say, Flora. Yeah, Floratam maybe, yeah. Raleigh. And then there's a new one that's coming out uh, that, that I think should be on the market. Uh, last I read, uh, coming this next year uh, in limited quantities, and I think it's Dallas 605 or something to that degree, but I, I think they renamed it again. I, every time I turn around, they rename them. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know it, it, so it makes it kind of complicated. You know, you have to go back and really look and find out the last time somebody did something with it. Uh, but we're going to look at some of those in comparison to one another. Uh, and of course, your your Bermudas. We'd like to try maybe a couple of different Bermudas. There's one out there called Celebration that I would really like to look at. And then there's, uh, of course, zoysias. Uh, I'd like to try three or four different types of zoysias as well. And um, and one of the things we, we've kind of looked at there's 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 some native seed mixes out there that that are just kind of wild growing type native plants that stay short in stature so uh, that may address some of the water conservation things Um, but then again you know when i do whenever i do a turf management or turf you know maintenance type program i always teach the class and until variety selection is how green do you want it and for how long right Uh, and don't worry brown's a color too you know Um, (laughs) so and i always start with saint augustine because saint augustine is the one that gives you green for the longest period of time yeah and 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 people don't realize i guess that uh grass goes dormant in the winter time it just turns brown that's the natural color of it in the winter time i think we're just unfortunate where we live you know exactly we we have a a kind of a sense of flux that happens right yeah (laughs) exactly exactly uh i was just wondering about uh cool weather ornamentals too in uh in our uh in our lawns in our gardens Uh, yeah, a great time to put those out. Um, in fact, I noticed my subdivision had already put some out already, and, and they're growing well. Uh, just make sure that you can water them probably once a month. Uh, it, it's not something they uh, they don't need a whole lot of water or anything, but you get dianthus and Johnny Jump Ups and ornamental kales and all kinds of other little cabbages and petunias and stuff. And what about compost? Uh, you know, I, I use a lot of compost, but I don't know. Yeah. what your feelings are on it uh compost is good i i, th- I think i have a, a tendency to want to keep my weeds down to a minimum so i use more of a mulch uh-huh. and, and let that break down and become compost eventually so it's a constant replenishment of mulch sure that mulch just mm-hmm. just uh, disintegrates and actually becomes over compost over mm-hmm. the time over, over time. time yeah it, it, it almost kind of becomes like liquid compost oh uh, okay like yeah. a compost tea eventually <laughs> that's great yeah Especially if you're not adding anything else into it or doing anything like that. Okay. All right. We're going to take a break. Uh, you're okay. listening to the Extension Hour uh, with Bob Daly, and we're having a great time and talking Mike about Potter. your. Yeah. Hey, whatever. We're talking about winter chores, and we'll get to you back in just a minute. You are listening to the Extension Hour on IRLoneStar.com. Have a legal question? Are you a resident of Montgomery County? Call 281-645-6344 to talk to a volunteer attorney from the Woodlands Bar Association. We answer the phones on the first Monday of every month at 281-645-6344 from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. to provide general legal information and information about legal resources to Montgomery County residents. I'm Andrea Kolsky. And I'm Heather Hall. You may have heard of Justice Being Blind. But what about being blonde? In our show, Justice Blonde, we talk about what's going on in Montgomery County at the courthouse behind the scenes. Hey, Andrea, don't forget about Harris County, too. And honestly, Heather, nationwide, we cover it all. Airing every Friday at 11 a.m., you can send in your burning questions to our email, justiceisblonde.lonestar at gmail.com. Or they can look us up on Facebook at Justice is Blonde. Or they could even call in to the station at 936-647-3776. Although we are discussing the law, we're trying to keep it fun, and we have some awesome guests. So tune in Friday for some legal fun, laughter, and an hour with the Blontourage. 
Hi, this is BJ Orner from Montgomery County Performing Arts Society. I'm here to remind you to get your tickets now for all the upcoming events that McPass has to offer. All shows will be held at the beautiful Crichton Theater in downtown Conroe. Call 936-441-7469 for your tickets today. Or go to our website, www.mcpass.org, for more information. Hope to see you at the show. And we're back um, here with Bob Daly, and my name is Michael Potter. I'm Mike. You're, you're listening to the Extension Hour, and we're going to be talking about everything there is to do as far as winter chores and even some water conservation things that you can be doing around the, uh, the yard uh, in, in prepare, preparation for the uh, spring, I should say. Hey, Mike, I just wanted to mention that um, we have Master Gardeners uh, on a hotline over at uh, Extension right now. Uh, their number is 936-539-7824, and uh, they're there uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, from 8 to noon, and then they take a lo- an hour for lunch, and then from 1 to 5, they're there. So if you have a call, if you have a question about plants, you can definitely call them, or you can even stop by the uh, extension office on Airport Road and uh, Bring your plant in, and they'll they'll try to identify the problem. Yeah, we, we have our own kind of mini lab up there. We we kind of run. Uh, we've got uh, we've got some uh, microscopes and some other you know things up there. That, but we can also you know diagnose most of the plant problems, insects and things like that, just from the office. And it makes it really a good place for people to come up and uh, and give that in, and share that information with them. I've been up there, uh, brought some grass samples and you helped me identify some take all patch and some mm-hmm. other stuff up there uh yeah. look, using the microscope it was fantastic i really enjoyed that yeah that's that's one of the things that's really fun to do i, I kind of wish i could do more of it sometimes <laughs> yeah i understand well you're a busy man that's uh let's talk about trees you want to talk about trees for a minute because this is a good yeah. time yeah it's a good time uh if you have any kind of any, any trees and everything you're considering moving smaller trees and things like that now's a great time to do it um, as they go dormant, they're storing everything down in their root system, and, and they're not really doing anything as far as production. So it's a great time to move them. Um, I've, I've moved many and, and sometimes quite large crepe myrtles this time of year oh God, yeah. and, and have had great success. You know, and That's one of those things that just kind of happens. But uh, occasionally uh, uh, my wife will say, I don't want that there, so I have to move it even though I know where it should go. Uh, well, I understand, yes. <laughs> she's always right. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, we, we've it, this is the best time to do that, and it, it causes the least amount of damage and, and mm-hmm. kind of gives them a good start for the spring. They really go into a root development mode at that point. When you plant a tree, um, I was always told that you don't do any amendments on it, but I, I, I don't know if that's exactly right. You want to? Yeah, in fact, uh, when it comes to fruit trees, that it may be the case that you would have to add amendments uh-huh. or do something different to increase drainage. That uh-huh. is the most important thing. And there are trees that require drainage. They don't like wet feet. So it depends on your soil. And there's some things that you can do to find out, you know, do I have adequate drainage? Um, they, they tell you, you know, dig a hole about one foot wide and about a you know, foot and a half deep. And then fill it with water and see how fast it, it drains. And if it's sitting there overnight, you might as well b- build a swimming pool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and, and so those are some of, the, some of the things you have to look at. And there's some good uh, guides and everything that tell you how to do that. The most important thing, I, I, I think, is planting the tree is to really pay attention to the hole. Um, and, in fact, there was... I was, when I was going to school, I, I had a professor actually tell us that it was you should take all this soil and mix it up, and you should make this concoction and put the tree back in it. Uh-huh. And uh, that you know slowly became non-existent. They they found out that what happens is that tree gets so happy in that one area that all the roots stay there. Really? And, yeah, that makes sense. Yep, yeah. And those trees will basically uproot themselves in a heavy wind or right. rain or things like that because that root system is supposed to spread out and be the anchor for that tree. So the natural, the dirt that you take out of the soil, that you take out of the hole, should be put back, back in the hole. Back so. in the hole. That's correct. And, in fact, you know, most times somebody says, well, I had a little bit of extra left over. Uh-huh. That's a good thing. You actually, out beyond where you've d- dug the hole, which hopefully should be about twice the size of the root ball, not the actual 
trunk of the tree because I know right. some people they they'll they'll plant they'll make a hole just as big as the pot and that's it. Right. And they'll stick yeah. it in there. You do want to loosen up the soil around that because you want those root systems to really start to grow and develop in the soil that they're going to be in. Mm-hmm. Simple as that. You can't if you start putting other things in there, they just get too happy in one spot. It kind of resembles get root bound and get root bound and circle and things like that and it just stresses a tree out and 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 basically decreases the lifespan of that tree what about watering watering um in fact with the extra soil you can sometimes make a little raised dam around the outside yeah uh, and, and also mulch the trees. That's another mm-hmm. good thing to do, but just be careful how you mulch. But first of all, let's tack the, wa- tack the watering thing. You, you basically use this bowl that you created mm-hmm. because you've raised up the sides with this extra soil, right. and, and you use that as your watering container in a sense. You, you okay. fill that yeah. up and water the tree. Um, and and the, that should be done you know, in the very beginning growth and development stages of a tree twice to three times a week just depending on temperatures and, and how how much evaporation is taking place and then we're talking about mulch mulch yeah, yeah. i was going to ask you about that because you see all these oh. trees with volcanoes piled up against the uh yes. against the there, trunk there's quite a bit of education that could be done with that <laughs> and uh we wish we could attack every single one of them but uh unfortunately uh they do they create a volcano and, uh-huh. and basically pile this the, the mulch all the way up the sides of the tree and what they don't realize is that it's doing several things. Number one, it's keeping a exoskeleton of a tree, the bark, uh-huh. and it's keeping it wet, and it starts to deteriorate, and then insects can infest it. Fungal pathogens can infest. Uh-huh. It's not hardened off to that type of environment. It's it's hardened off to be exposed to the elements. So when you add this mulch and everything to it, it moistens it, it softens it, and it, of course, can cause tree death. Right. or major uh, insect infestation or fungal pathogens to, to infect the tree. So how should it be put on? That should be uh, four to six inches thick, mm-hmm. okay, is what I always recommend, four to six inches thick, but taken back away from the trunk of the tree about one inch. Okay. And that way, that's exposed. That way there is airflow through there. And, and one to two inches. You don't have to be specific and go get a measuring tape and measure it out. It's just keep it away from that main trunk. Right. And, of course, when you do plant that tree, there's a part that's called the crown of the tree. It's the part where it kind of uh, takes an angle away from the trunk. And starts going down into the root system. Right. That should always be exposed. Okay. You, sh- you should see that. Some people think it should be at a 90 degrees. No, that's 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 basically uh, choking the tree. Um. I see this a lot, especially on golf courses, uh, the knuckling of crepe myrtles. You want to talk? Can we, <laughs> can we talk murder. about the crepe murder? <laughs> yes. Uh, peop- it's, it goes back to the, the very, what we should think from the very beginning. Uh-huh. How big of a trio do I want for that specific area? If it's going to be too big, then select something else. Right. Um, because all you're doing is damaging it. And, and what happens is people say, well, I don't want it that tall. So they go and they cut, you know, two or three inch thick branches that are coming off these crepe myrtles and some of these trees. And then what happens is these nodes go absolutely crazy. Uh-huh. And they start producing all the little branches and everything off these nodes. Well, they keep cutting them back from that point, And so you get these big old knots. Uh-huh. And, and uh, that's what happens. And it's actually detrimental to the tree does it shorten the life of the tree it can yeah it, it it's it's basically a stress point uh-huh. and, and the, it's kind of like us when we get tired or yep. you know run down or things like that we can get stressed and we you know succumb to colds sure. sinus infections everything well yeah trees are the same way they're a living thing that that has that kind of system that once they're stressed there can be uh, pathogens and things that infect okay can we talk about mulch mulch Mulch, mulch, mulch. Let's mulch. Um, and that that is I, I can't tell you enough how how important mulch is to conserve the moisture, but also to provide extra nutrients to plants. Four to six inches is is minimal. And not just on trees. On, yeah, on not your on trees. Landscape. On, yep, on beds. your landscape beds. Um, and I'm sure that you know I know that you you abide by that rule because sure. you know water conservation is important to us. Um, and, and the biggest thing is is that there's a difference between mulch and compost. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and compost is something that almost resembles soil. It can still have larger chunks in it, uh-huh. but it almost resembles soil. I prefer to go more towards larger chunks of wood. I don't like the soil-looking type 
of mulch that, mm-hmm. that they do sell. I'm used to something a little different from down in South Texas. They they would our uh, landfill actually would grind all the trees and everything right and sure and, and compost it in a sense. Uh, for a short period of time, and they would sell that as mulch, and they were big pieces. You know, sometimes you'd end up with two, three, four inch pieces of wood. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we would use that as compost, and that keeps your weeds down, which keeps competition uh, between weeds and plants down to a minimum. Uh, I have to use it. it it's a must right. for me. And it also helps conserve water, mm-hmm. uh, uh, keeps the plants, uh, the plant roots at a right. pretty stable temperature. Mm-hmm. That, and that, that's very important coming this time of year. With winter coming into play, is if you have tender perennials or, or tender plants that are in those areas, if they're if they're mulched properly, that'll keep some of that heat trapped in that that soil right there around them, and they'll be able to survive and, and back, come back up in the spring. I get calls all the time about going you know going out to people's yards, and I see a lot of dyed mulch. Is that you want to talk about that? I, yeah, I'm, there's there's been a lot of um, kind of hoopla about it lately, and um, I, I go back to. A lot of times when, when people want to select a mulch, it, it's it's a preference. It's, it's a visual mm-hmm. preference. Mm-hmm. Um, they want the red or they want the brown or they want the, you know, the the black one. Okay. Right. Um, and, yes, it does add a aesthetic look to it, but it depends on the product that was used or how they actually dyed the product. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some dyes that are not very good for plants like some of them have arsenic in mm-hmm. it they leach out and uh, there's been you know uh, there's been I, I, every now and then i'll see something on a blog or something or read something about uh, you know somebody found basically chopped up treated wood that or you know something right. like that that wasn't natural or right. you know there wasn't good wood it was been treated with something and it, and it leached out and caused problems and or that they feel that it would um so, you know, good native hardwood mulches are, are probably the best thing to use. You know, I, I know that some some people, uh, some areas, they some cities and municipalities mm-hmm. do have that. When they cut the trees down and stuff, they'll mulch all that stuff up. And uh, mm-hmm. some of them offer it for free. I don't know anybody in the neighborhood that does that, but uh, yeah. it's a great service. It is. It is. Uh, evergreen trees and uh, shrubs and planting indoor stuff. Okay. Yeah, the uh, you know all your indoor plants uh, this time of year. Um, it, it, if you know you're starting to move them in, if they're you know maybe patio plants or something like that, and you start to move them in because you want to protect them from the cold, uh, you know just just keep them you know moderately watered. Don't overwater those plants. If they you get them inside and they start kind of dropping leaves and acting unhappy, it may be because they need a little bit more sunlight. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and that that's one of the things that does does occur common. Uh, out there that you know we we bring them in they're they're used to a little bit more sunlight and plus this time of year shorter days mm-hmm. they get less sunlight so they may need a little bit more sunlight intensive uh, area so you may need to move them or something like that what about pruning trees and this is a good time to prune them right uh depends uh-huh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um you know things that are uh, if you have plants and it goes with shrubs especially in any of your perennials you don't really want to prune a lot at this point in time. Mm-hmm. You know, minimal pruning is good uh, to shape it up or do something like that. But if there's a plant that or plants that get you know, or can have frost or freeze damage, uh, it's not a good time to prune, sure. prune, you know, prune them because then what happens is we'll get a freeze. It'll knock them back even further. So the, what you thought was perfect cut now becomes a bad cut. Right. <laughs> so and, and so things like that, you know, I, I don't I try not to do a lot of pruning I, I really like to wait till spring when things start to sprout out mm-hmm. so i can and i, I i'm kind of bad about this I, i'm like a micro pruner <laughs> <laughs> i make sure when i make a cut there is a node right there that's already developed sure. and yeah. i know exactly where that plant's going to go yeah uh you know trimming trees so they grow up not down i mean there's a lot of little tips and things like that that can be and i noticed that some of the, some of my plants uh they'll They'll be uh, uh, kind of look like they're dead in the wintertime, and then l- when they sprout out in the spring, then I could cut back to that sprout. Uh, uh, yeah. So it, I do a lot of that. Yeah, you have to. Huh? But you've got, uh, you know, when you when you do have a plant that, you, you know, dies over the winter, trim it up mm-hmm. in, the, in the, you know, spring. Once temperatures warm up, once it starts to show some growth, you can trim off all the dead parts on it uh that have you know either succumbed to freeze or whatever and sure. then that way it'll it, that way you can kind of train it better 
uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, the Master Gardeners are uh, over at uh, the Extension Service. They're at 936-539-7824. And if you have a question, you can call us here at 936-647-3776, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. We do have a bunch of questions in here that people have uh, emailed in, and we'll, we'll get to those in a little while, if that's okay with you, Mike. Perfectly fine. You are listening to the Extension Hour on IRLoneStar.com. Tune in to Chamber Chat with your host, Courtney Galley and Samantha Good, with the Conroe Lake Conroe Chamber of Commerce every first Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. I'm one of your hosts, Courtney Galley. Samantha and I will chat about the Conroe Chamber's upcoming events and programs for the month. Relax with a cup of joe or your favorite drink for Chamber Chat. The East Texas Dream Center is in need of your help. We are a nonprofit Christian organization that houses women and children who are trying to get their lives back after being homeless, abused, or addicted. We are conveniently located at 301 South First Street, Conroe, Texas, 77301, right here in Montgomery County. Our needs are financial and every needs of gasoline, cleaning supplies, laundry soap, Lysol, and whatever else God puts in your heart. To help our ladies and children, please consider a donation. You may visit our website at www.easttexasdreamcenter.org. Again, so you don't forget, it's www.easttexasdreamcenter.org. Donations are tax deductible. Remember what Jesus said, with God, nothing is impossible. Our community's animal shelters cannot absorb accidental litters of kittens and puppies. Approximately 80% of the animals entering our shelters will not make it out alive. Please help be a part of the solution. Please spay and neuter your pets. Many low-cost options are available. Visit TexasLitterControl.org to learn more. That's TexasLitterControl.org. And remember, real Texans don't litter. Please spay and neuter your pets. You are listening to the Extension Hour on IRLoneStar.com. And we're back. Uh, we're talking about some of the winter chores. I'm here with uh, Mr. Bob Daly. Howdy, Bob. Hi, Mike. All right. We're going to tackle a few more of the things you could be doing uh, this time of year. Uh, you know, we were talking about, I just kind of thought about it just a second ago, we were talking about grass and stuff like that. Sure. And that, that's one of those things we kind of fail to mention this time of year because we're talking about it going dormant. Right. But for some people, you know, grass doesn't stay dormant. It, it Well, it goes dormant, but they still have green lawn. Exactly. Because there's green weeds growing out of it. Sure. <laughs> but uh, one of the things they can do to help minimize that is to go ahead and, and get out there and mow the yard and, and keep those seed heads from developing uh, on some of those uh, those broadleaf weeds that happen during the winter. So when uh, yeah, I see that coming up all the time. Those little uh, plantains and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So if you cut them, uh, say every two weeks or something, mm-hmm. drew your lawn. What about watering in the wintertime? Watering. Uh, we're going to talk about that. In yeah, a minute, we're going to talk a lot about watering. I, I just. I, I'm I'm one of those people that just doesn't do it. Yeah, I don't it's either. dormant. It, it's not growing. It's not active. It's not taking any water. And, and we get plenty of rain in the winter. Exactly, too. Uh, especially this year. I mean, they're they're forecasting a a a, a different year. A uh, lot more rain and and cool, colder temperatures. Colder temperatures. Yeah. Yeah. So. So it, with El Nino out there, it's mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I kind of like to talk a little bit more about water. If you're yeah, I'm up for it. We can get after it. Uh, you know, we we were looking at at the water system and the water s- situation here in Montgomery County. Uh, it's hard for people to realize that uh, you know, ninety seven and a half percent of all the water on Earth is salt and and salty, and they, we can't drink that. And there's only two and a half percent of all the water on this planet is uh, is fresh, and less than one percent of that is. Uh, is available for drinking and agriculture and all our needs. Uh, and even more of that is tied up in glacial ice and polar ice. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that we probably, this is, you know, I'm, pre- I'm, I'm the choir here. I'm the <laughs> preacher in the choir. I, I really am, am passionate about water. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that and see where we're, 
Yeah, water. Where are we headed? Yeah, water conservation. Uh, it, it, it's 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 important, and from a standpoint that we all know, we we hear it on the news. You know, California's in, in a huge drought. Their sure. la- I mean, their lakes are fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty feet down, and I mean, they're they're struggling. They can't. They're having to divert water. They've got aquifers, basically, I mean, big old ditches that run water across the nation. And, and do we really want to be there? No, of course not. Yeah, and and it's it just. I've got two kids, and, and both of them love a nice warm shower. And some of them, sometimes it's too long. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I'm the the uh, the, the warden. Water on police. That one. Yeah, I'm the water police. The water goes off, and and you you have a minute warning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know it, it's it's just it, there's no sense, and and it's it goes back to your plants. You, you know, people who water their yard just over water and over water, and they're watering three, four, five days a week. Sure. Uh, it's it's pointless. We're going to get to the point where, do you want to drink it, or do you want to give it to the plants? Mm-hmm. And, and so, it, it's coming. You know, and, and when I don't know. Uh, you know, there's forecasts out there. There's predictions and things like that. Uh, but when it happens, you know, I think people will change. We'll have to change. Right. But that's what we're trying to do. And I think with a lot of the water conservation programs, they're trying to give people tools. And, you know, kind of give them a good Home Depot tool belt or, you know, sure. Lowe's tool belt or something, a, a tool belt to help them where they don't use so much water. Well, you know, um, I uh, I was looking at uh, Bob Mace, uh, who is with the Texas Water Development Board, and he was pointing out that in the last, well, 15 years, since the year 2000, 93% of Texas has been in a, in a drought at one time or another, mm-hmm. and 39% of, of all the state has been in a drought during that period, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty significant. But mm-hmm. I, I like the things that our legislature is doing. Uh, you know, they're doing some pretty good things like the SWIFT project where people can go in and companies, water districts, can go in and borrow money uh, at a real reduced rate to, to develop water projects. I think if California had done what, what the state is doing now, what the Texas state is doing, uh, they wouldn't be having this problem today. I really, th- I really think there's a, a whole uh, uh, reason for that. You know, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, my, my, my son and I were having a discussion one day about this because they were talking about California's water problems on the news. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's a 14-year-old, pretty, pretty opinionated little kid, and I don't know where he came I from. don't know where no, he came from, no. Um, but he, uh, we were sitting there talking, and, and, I, and he said, Dad, you know, why has this happened? I said, well, you know, you can look at it many different ways. He said, no, Dad, give me a real answer. Mm-hmm. I said, well, what the real answer was, so many people moved to California that they didn't have the resources there already. Right. You know, you don't have any resources. Where are you going to get it from? That's right. You, you can't borrow. No. Yes. I mean, where are you going to get the water? Yeah. Right now, I mean, all the good land in Texas to develop lakes is gone. That's right. Yeah. They're the only thing, I mean, the, I can't remember what the, the direct amount. I mean, there's only like 20 acre, 30 acre lakes or something that can be developed because they're so small. They're so something. small. And then, you know, they. Uh, I've had the, the question asked, why don't they expand Lake Conroe? Well, they can't because, mm-hmm. I mean, there's. There's only so much you can expand to. Well, was it somebody asked me, he said, why wouldn't it, when they had the drought and it got 10 feet down, why didn't they go ahead and scoop all that soil around the edges? You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of those houses around there might, might object to that. Yeah. You're now on a cliff. You just don't realize it yet. You know, in, in Montgomery County, we have currently 500, about 500,000 people, about a half a million people. Mm-hmm. And I know we use 27 billion gallons a year. Wow. And... About fifth, that's about 54,000 per person per year and about 150 gallons a day per person. Well, right now we're pumping out of our aquifer, uh, 84,000 acre feet, which is about 27 billion gallons, which meets our needs. The problem is that 64,000 acre feet is the only, uh, is the maximum that the aquifer can recharge at. So we have a deficit of about 7 billion gallons right there. Um, by 2035, we're going to have a million people here in Montgomery County. That's going to mean, based on today's usage, 54 billion gallons, double of what we, we need now. Yeah. Uh, and that's a lot of water. That is a ton of water. And, I, you know, I, I don't know 
I don't, I don't want to get into the political aspects of, of it not. and everything, but the, the whole thing is what we do in Extension is we try to give you the tools to help you and help in a means to save you in the pocketbook because water is getting more expensive. Ooh, that's true. And, and you know, we, it, it's, it just is. So you have to deal with it at some point that it's, it's like I said, we're going to get to that point where it's right. going to be either drink it right, or do you really want to put it on those plants? Or like Wichita Falls, who's using recycled sewage right. to drink. Yeah, and they've, and they've been doing that and even in California, some in areas California. of California for quite a while. And, and you know. It's kind of distasteful, and, but, you, yeah, know, you know, the astronauts have been doing it for a while. That's correct. Yeah, that is correct. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things out there that they can do. You know, we've got. A lot of stuff at the extension office that people can come by and look at, you know, to help them make better choices when it comes to water conservation. Sure. Uh, you know, just some general understanding, uh, you know, talking about turf grass. All turf grass needs is one inch of water per week, period. And that's to sustain growth. Right. Why do we want any more than that? And and I always go back, you know, it goes back to the, the good old days and the English gardens with the mustache hedges and everything else. We got we got to have that green loving. You know, we got to sure. compete. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Sure, and uh, and that's why I always say brown's a color too. Yeah, um, you know, there are certain things that happen you can't control, and, and and I know some people think they can control that by throwing more pesticides, throwing more herbicides or fungicides on their lawn. Right. It, it doesn't. It, it actually hurts the environment. It doesn't. It doesn't do any good. Right. You know. And fertilizers and things like that will, will require more water. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah. I leach. See, I see and they, they can leach into the groundwater. Leach so. into the groundwater. And we mm-hmm. still, we're already having problems in Galveston Bay where all this water is going. Correct. Uh, yeah. In fact, that, that brings up a, a good little, I guess, past history for me. Being in Corpus Christi and living on the bay. Yeah. And, and I was able to kind of predict what would happen with red you know brown tides red tides and things sure. like that yeah i could always you know it, we'd have a big rain event i say oh you watch here in about two weeks we're gonna start having brown tide again and it would happen and, and it's because all those nutrients and everything got flushed out into the bays and estuaries and uh it was it was very detrimental um you know fungicides and, and herbicides and stuff there there is residual of everything right you know well, some things do break down naturally with uv light some things don't um, what are some of the other things that we're doing for uh, that extension is doing for water conservation? Uh, yeah, we're. I tell you what, we've got we've got a list of things. Most everything that I try to do, uh, and most of our speakers try to do, is, is try to talk about water conservation with whatever topic that we're talking about. Uh-huh. You know, um, what we've really done is tried to 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 show people, you know, hey, we're we're doing water conservation here at the extension office. We've mm-hmm. got drip irrigation everywhere. We've got rainwater harvesting. And those are some of the classes and things that we try to do and we'll be holding some of those this next uh, spring, actually starting uh January. Uh You mentioned something about a schedule you have. Yeah, we have a schedule coming up uh in January. We've got about uh 6 events uh that will be scheduled starting January 16th. We're going to be talking about fruit and nut trees right and how to care maintain and select those uh we have uh, february 20th i'll be talking about lawns up at the extension office um, these will all be all be at the extension office they're all on saturday mornings um perfect and, those and, are good times mm-hmm. because yeah and they're just one hour one and a half maybe two hour at the most type things and and, right. and we're you know we just want to touch people quickly and you know don't take up a whole lot of their time but give them the right information give it to them quickly and let them get out the i door. like that so we'll be on March 5th, you know, it gets close to the time of gardening. So right. we're going to have a gardening 101. On April 2nd, we're going to be talking about a little bit about entomology, which is about the time we start seeing a whole bunch of insects. That's right, yeah. So, uh, and then on April 23rd, we're going to talk about water conservation, rainwater harvesting, irrigation. We're going to have a pretty big event for that. Mm-hmm. So, and then to wrap up uh, the spring on May 14th, we're going to have an open gardens day to invite people to come out and see what we do and see some of the things that we do at the extension office. That was really successful the last time you did it. I mean, you had a tremendous turnout from them. Yes, sir. We really enjoy doing them. We'll be doing two of them a year, one in the oh, fall, one in the great. spring. That's great. Well, you're listening to the Extension Hour. I'm Michael Potter, and here with Bob Dalen, we're talking about water conservation and uh, chores and things for the wintertime. You are listening to the Extension Hour on IRLoneStar.com. I'm Andrea Kolsky. And I'm Heather Hall. You may have heard of justice being blind. But what about being blonde? 
In our show, Justice Blonde, we talk about what's going on in Montgomery County at the courthouse behind the scenes. Hey, Andrea, don't forget about Harris County, too. And honestly, Heather, nationwide, we cover it all. Airing every Friday at 11 a.m., you can send in your burning questions to our email, justiceisblonde.lonestar at gmail.com. Or they can look us up on Facebook at Justice is Blonde. Or they could even call in to the station at 936-647-3776. Although we are discussing the law, we're trying to keep it fun, and we have some awesome guests. So tune in Friday for some legal fun, laughter, and an hour with the Blontourage. Hello, Montgomery County. I'm Rachel Baldwin with Special Olympics Texas Area 6. Are you a fan of courage? Are you a fan of determination? Are you a fan of acceptance, grace, and skill? then you're already a fan of Special Olympics. Make it official. Volunteer, coach, and or compete and be a fan of dignity and acceptance. The dedication of our Special Olympic Texas volunteers provides mainstreaming experiences for athletes with intellectual disabilities. You will touch the heart of another person and it will move you in a meaningful way that lifts the spirit. Please visit the Heart of East Texas Area 6 webpage at www.sotx.org. Also, like us on Facebook to be a fan and be part of Special Olympics Texas. You're listening to the Extension Hour with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Visit us online at montgomery.agrilife.org. All right, we're back. I'm here with Bob Daly. My name is Michael Potter. Uh, oh, we're Mike. gonna, we're we're gonna, I'm, Bob. We're gonna get to some stuff here. We we kind of we had some questions come in ahead of time. It kind of got me excited. It means yeah. people like, listen to us. So um, that's right, and that that's a good thing. And uh, I, I like what you did. I, I you know I have a personal Twitter account and stuff like that, and I see it. I see you shot it out, and next thing I know, we got questions coming. So it was kind of exciting to me to kind of see that, and some people wanted to take part and and, and kind of ask some of the questions that. that Everybody wants to know. Uh, the first one uh, we got is, is from a, a gentleman named Tony. Uh, what are some of the programs that are in place to educate your youth importance of water conservation? Well, one of the things that's going on is the Junior Master Gardeners. Uh, they have been really, really active in, uh, in water conservation and teaching the kids what, uh, what good water sense is. Uh, and you may want to comment on that some more, but... Uh, yeah, they've got they've got a whole bunch of good water you know water type programs where they learn the water cycle and and things like that and how to conserve water in your home and outside your home and and I know that uh, like I think even Cindy Conroe had a little program where they had kits and things that they were taking to the schools. They to, did, yes, yeah, for teachers and there were some things like that going on. So you know, not not only in a large scale, but it's it's kind of like me being the. Uh, the the uh, the the water warden in my house. I, th- I think it all. Yeah. We have to teach that from the beginning. I agree. Um, there's a reason why my kid likes to eat salad. <laughs> it's because he saw me do it. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, you know? That's right. Yeah. And, and, and so those are the things that I think. You know, a lot of times we lead by example. Um, I agree. And, and and that's important. One of the things I noticed at the extension, uh, Sandy Goss and and uh, Junior Master Gardeners have put in their children's garden. And in the children's garden, they have a lot of drip irrigation, mm-hmm. and it's just really fantastic, and it's gorgeous. It that is. That garden is really beautiful. Yeah, and not only it, not only is it drip irrigation, it runs off the rainwater harvesting tanks there, That's too. right, yeah. So uh, we do have a backup plan just in case, but uh, there's enough water there to supply that whole thing. I think we've got another. Uh, yeah, here's another, the second part of his question is, do you believe interactive smart homes, nest-type technologies, will help get more people involved in conserving water or you know yeah be it I, not tony i agree with that uh uh the uh there are a lot of great project uh products coming out on the market right now there are products that you can actually put in in lieu of your controller uh and it will automatically con- connect with the national aeronautics and uh and uh, space administration uh mm-hmm. whatever it is uh the uh NOAA weather mm-hmm. uh and local weather stations and it will actually adjust your sprinklers to whatever as rain has occurred in your area. Uh, and we just set one up at the uh, Water Resources Building in uh, in the Woodlands. Uh, 
and I can I actually operate it with my telephone. Oh, I could nice. be in I could be anywhere. I can be in Corpus Christi there you and, go. and uh, set it up. These things are good. There's one out called Blossom. I know that uh, that we're doing a rebate program on, uh, and it's it's a great product. I really like yeah. them. There's a lot of things out there, and and. It, and, and for the people that really don't want to do a smart technology or, you know, have our older systems, sure. there is a great piece of technology God gave us. Yeah. <laughs> and it's called the off button. Um, That's true. You know, yeah. it, it, it's okay to turn it off. I mean, you don't have to let it run all the time. Um, you know, there, there's irrigation audits. There's all kinds of other little things that people can do sure. to conserve water. It, it, Wise guys. That's it. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of there, there's right. a whole bunch of sources out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's things that we can do and there's technologies out there that are available. Uh, sometimes technology gets a little too cumbersome from people, but, uh, but for the most part, you know, just be, just be a little bit more educated about it. I agree. Um, it's another question for, uh, from, uh, Linda Crum. Uh, she's a, what can citizens do when they see big water, see water being wasted in public spaces? Uh, well, if they're in the woodlands, they can call me, uh, my number is 832-813-6906, and just let me know, uh, and we'll take care of it. In, the, in Conroe, if you live in Conroe, call the uh, Public Utilities Department. They have some great people over there, and uh, they can do some, some, uh, take some action on that. Um, in, the, uh, in the outlying areas, maybe uh, call your MUD and report that at your MUD, MUD department, and they will... Uh, they will take care of that. I know there's some muds that have been very proactive about mm-hmm. that. Yeah, there's there's nothing worse than driving home in a rain, and I see irrigation, irrigation systems, systems yeah, watering, yeah. you know. Drives me um, crazy. And, and that's another part of technology that can be implemented with a lot of the irrigation system is a rain sensor. A simple rain sensor. 35 50 bucks, something that's like right. that. Done. It shuts it off when it rains. And a lot of communities offer rebates on those things, so, mm-hmm. you know. Yep, that's another way to do it. Another one from uh, Mr. Doug Goodwin. I have a question. I hear cities and utilities constantly, constantly say that high water use is due to landscape irrigation. If so, why don't more cities and utilities take steps to ensure that these systems are installed properly? Boy, that's a good question, Doug. Um, wh- last year, we, uh, Michael and I and, and uh, Mike Heimer and uh, some other people s- tried to set up a, uh, a program for training uh irrigation specialist irrigation people to uh to uh, uh registered illiga- uh, licensed irrigation people in continuing education about water conservation and we have that program online and uh, i mean getting ready to go into production i think we're looking at february or march something yes, february, like that yeah. um and we'll be putting that together some of the some of the communities do have programs uh, conroe has a good program the woodlands has a good program i think uh uh, Oak Ridge North in uh, in uh, down in the south part of the co- county has a good program for licensing and permitting, but some of the some of the communities do not have those uh, those programs, and they probably should. And and uh, if if you're in a community that doesn't have a licensing program or a permitting program or a good training program for irrigation people, you might want to talk to your city officials or your or even your MUDs, whoever whoever approves that, or even the county. Well, I, th- I think it all goes down to, and I've, I've had to deal with this in my past, is city codes, county codes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Landscaping codes and those types of things. You have to make things mandatory. That's right. I, I mean, agree with you. Yeah, if yeah. you don't make them mandatory, and then nobody's going to abide by it. buy it. If you make too many loopholes, that's what they're going to find. They're, they're going to find, find the loopholes. loopholes. And one of the things we found was that a lot of people who, uh, a lot of the ingen- the irrigation people, left where they had good licensed uh, uh, licensing and permitting uh, uh, regulations, they left those areas and went to the areas where it, that didn't. Mm-hmm. So you're getting a lot of, uh, I hate to say this, but jack like people out there mm-hmm. uh, who are doing um, very poor work. Uh, and without those uh, regulations, they're, they're not going to, you're going to get bad, bad service. Yeah, I, know, I know we're getting close on time here. Uh, I'm going to finish with one thing, I guess, that, that it's kind of important. Um, Extension has a program out there called EarthKind. Yes. And uh, if you go to earthkind.tamu.edu, there's a lot of ways that you can look up publications and things that you can do on there to, to investigate a solid system uh, that was designed for water conservation, protection of the environment, you know, reduction of uh, waste and things like that. Um, we're 
having we're actually putting one in at our at our extension office. It's going to be powered and basically watered with uh, uh, two big old uh, water, rainwater harvesting tanks. So uh, we've got some great support uh, from the from from people and and from uh, other outside sources that help fund this. Um, but it, it's 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 a program that that allows you to plant plants and gives you a selection of plants that are going to survive in this program. And I, I think I've said this before, you plant the plants, you, and you get them established for one year. And after that first year, you turn off your irrigation and you only water them once or twice a year. And that's it. That is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can really save yeah. a lot of water like that. Yeah. So it's one of those things that's there. Uh, it's there for the public. And like I said, earthkind at timid.edu. If you have any other uh, questions, uh, we have that Master Gardener hotline, uh, 936-539-7824. And uh, thank you, Mr. Daly. Uh, thank it's you, always Mr. a Potter. pleasure. Same here. And uh, thank you all for joining us here at the Extension Hour. Have a good, happy holidays. <laughs>